Okay, good morning. Um, so today we are going to to cover the last topic, not of the course, the last topic before starting React. Mm? So next week we are going to start React. Um, that is, so what we are going to do today in these three hours is to put together, in a way, what we know about JavaScript and what we, we know about HTML and CSS. So to see how JavaScript can work and works in the browser. Uh, and we are going to do more or less the first hour of uh, uh, slides, let's say lecture, and the second hour of an exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, basically the same HTML page that we developed uh, last week. Mm -hmm. That is essentially the same. It's actually the same. It, it's the very same page. Mm -hmm. It's the very same HTML uh, code that we developed in class. It just fill up with the additional information, and we would like to add, and this is something that we'll do in the second hour, um, some dynamism inside the page, so we will load the exam list from JavaScript instead of having it directly in the HTML page, and then we will also add uh, the possibility to delete mm, an exam in the table. Mm. So we, we are just going to uh, add a little bit of interactivity to the page that we developed statically last week. But to do that, we, are, we need to uh, speak about how we can bring JavaScript in the browser. So there are two ways to, main way, to uh, load the JavaScript in the browser. The first one is inline. So you open a tag that is script, and you can write JavaScript code directly inside an HTML document. And now that you know that this method exists, as we did for inline CSS, just forgot about it. The, the, the other way, that is the recommended way, is the external loading of a JavaScript file. So still the, the script tag, hmm. but instead of writing JavaScript code in HTML, that is, that is bad because HTML is just for structure and JavaScript is not adding structure or semantic to the page, it's adding something else, hmm. you have to import externally. And so in the script tag, you can have a SRC attribute in which you can pass the file, hmm? the JavaScript file in your folder, in your project, on your server, that has exhibit the behavior that you want to have on the page. Hmm? And this is what we are going to do also today. We are creating a new JavaScript file, and we will add dynamic behavior. And if you look on the bootstrap code that we had uh, last week, actually, we already see an example of this. So Bootstrap suggests to add this script uh, for adding interactivity, the interactivity that the framework already have mm, inside, mm, included. And so you see, this is a clearly an external file get from, from the internet, mm, script, SRC, uh, etc. Mm. So we, are, we can do also this, not just with external JavaScript file made by other people, but also with our own JavaScript file, like we did, and you did in the lab, for CSS. Hmm? As we have the external CSS provided at Bootstrap, we also have our CSS hmm? provided by, by us, written by us. And so the same thing apply for JavaScript, but instead of using the link tag, you, you are going to use the script tag. Hmm? And, and, and why this is on the bottom of the page, typically? or at least now, mm. because JavaScript loads. Mm. So how it, how it loads this page? This page loads from the beginning to the end. And if JavaScript is at the beginning, 
with this traditional, uh, let's say, way, this, this way, exactly this way of importing JavaScript file, uh, it blocks the page. Hmm? So the browser processes the HTML page, link, Java, CSS, etc., and then link, load the JavaScript content. And if the JavaScript content took three minutes or two minutes or any other amount of time to process to do the, the calculation, maybe there is a for loop, or maybe there is uh, access to a database, maybe there is other things, hmm? or requests for access into a database, so time consuming um, operation, then the page is stuck there. Hmm? So the browser is waiting for the JavaScript file to complete the loading. So you will not see anything, if this is one of the first line on the page, you will not see anything on the web page. The web page will remain blank, uh, white, mm? uh, just uh, with the background maybe. Mm? Uh, because actually, it does, if this is in the head of the page, nothing is yet loaded in the page in terms of HTML and CSS. Mm? So that's why in this moment is in the end of the file. Because in this way, all the page is loaded, and then when all the page is ready, at that point, the browser can load the JavaScript. And you don't care too much in this point if this JavaScript file took one minute or 30 seconds to load completely, because the rest of the page is ready, and the people using the browser, using the web page, can read and scroll and navigate the page in its entirely. It doesn't show a white page uh, blocked and without any information what is happening. So that's why traditionally uh, JavaScript files are in the end of the body. And I said traditionally, um, and, and here there is the, the things I, I just told you, uh, I said traditionally, um, because, and, and this again, it's, it's an example. And so it start parsing the HTML, the browser start parsing the page, then fetch the script, execute the script, and the web page is just waiting for this operation to complete, and then continue to create the page. So in this point, the page again will be white, and, and nothing would seem to, to, be, to be ready to, to be done something. Instead, if you put it in the end, you see that the page is completely Mm -hmm. uh, loaded here, and then the JavaScript file can be loaded and executed. And this is the traditional approach. Um, then JavaScript e evolving a long time added two attributes for solving this problem and actually having the scripts loaded at the beginning of the page or in any position of the page actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and these two attributes are async and so in the head, at the beginning in the head, mm, whatever in the head of the page. And these two attributes are async and the fair. Mm. Uh, and it's the same way of writing, it's just a script, uh, an attribute, an additional attribute in that, in the tag. Mm. So with async, a script will be fetched in parallel mm, to parsing the HTML and evaluated as soon as they are ready. So they are not immediately executed, so nothing is blocked on the page. They are going parallel. The parsing of HTML and the loading of a script. Uh, with the fur, instead, mm, uh, you indicate that the script needs to be executed after the document has been totally parsed. Mm, but before that attribute, that event, DOM content loaded, is actually fired. Hmm? So if, you, if your JavaScript needs to parse the content of the, of the page, adding a new row to the table, changing the color, something, etc., will the, the JavaScript file will wait for that DOM content loaded. Hmm? That is, the content is ready and DOM is totally uh, built. Hmm? The tree of HTML elements is totally built on the page before uh, waiting for, for the script. So this guarantee the fur that uh, 
everything is execu executed in the order that are loaded and clearly the fur is the preferred way mm. and this is what happens mm. so there is with the fur there is the parsing of the, of the html there is the fetch in parallel but the execution is just after the html mm. so again it's not blocking like a sync that instead blocks a little bit of the uh, execution less than it, the traditional, the textbook method, but still it's blocking a little bit. Mm? So the fair is in practice the preferred way to load any JavaScript file in, um, in HTML. Mm? And, and this too needs to have a script in the head of the page. Mm? So let's do it for Bootstrap. So let me just cut this and put it in the head. Maybe after the CSS, here we can paste JavaScript. And we will add the fair, just to have uh, it ready. So it's the same script as before, just moved in the head with the fair in it. And so if we need to add our JavaScript file, we are going to write script src uh, app.js, mm, for instance, with the fur, clearly. And then we need to create an app.js file, etc. Uh, here, like we created a um, CSS file mm, with the same use script you strict that we had in the past. And here it's JavaScript. Mm? So we can write JavaScript code, console.log, for loops, uh, arrays, whatever we just need to, to do. Mm? So where does JavaScript code actually run when it's in the browser, mm? when it's attached to an HTML page? So the JavaScript code run in the browser sandbox. That means that the, the browser environment is protected with respect to the rest of your computer, of the user's computer. Because don't forget that the client, and here we are speaking about the client, is running on the person computer, the person that is visiting the website, not the developer, not the server. So it's another computer. And so this is in a sandbox. It doesn't have a direct access to elements in the computer, but it has access only through some dedicated APIs mm, that are made by the browser to do external operation. Mm. APIs that are HTML5 APIs, even if they are for JavaScript. And all the code mm, is attached to a global context that is a window object that can be also not be explicitly written in the code. Mm? So writing document dot um, uh, get element by D or writing window dot document dot get element by D where get element by D is actually a method uh, for manipulating the HTML page is the same. Mm? So with or without the window object in, in between. And through this window object that is attached to every JavaScript file loaded in, in the browser, you can have access to a set of APIs that are the usual API that you already know, the JavaScript itself, objects, array, functions, etc. But you also have access to the DOM and the BOM. So the browser object is the BOM, and the, do the DOM is the document object. Mm? So the DOM is where all the page is unfolding in JavaScript. So through the DOM, to the, that document object there, you can actually manipulate via JavaScript the content of the page. Mm? So again, you want to remove a line on a table, you can do it by by passing through the DOM, that document object written there. 
uh, you want to change color or something, you want to add interactivity, you want to open a model, you pass through um, the DOM, hmm? and so the document object. And then you also have the BOM hmm? uh, that is a little bit less used directly than the DOM, because again, the DOM is for manipulating the page while the BOM is for a browser, for accessing features from the browser. So through the BOM, you have, you don't have one big object that is document, you have many objects, like navigator for navigation, back and forth in the page, accessing the history of the browser. So all the elements that are proper to the browser. So history, back and forth, uh, location, so the URL, uh, in which you are. So everything that is outside your web page, but within the browser itself. And if you load the multiple script like we, we did uh, for uh, our own JavaScript file that is empty right now, uh, right now and the bootstrap JavaScript file, all, all these are actually independent from one another. So they access the same scope, they access the window, uh, but they are not, by default, speaking each other. There are ways to make separate JavaScript files speaking one another, uh, and modules that we are going to see a little bit later in, in the course are one of these. Hmm? But we already encounter modules uh, when we import a library in Node.js, when we wrote require something that was a module, a JavaScript module, that we import and we can interact between two different JavaScript files. Mm. So in the browser is slightly different, same concept, a slightly different way of using it. Not required, but we are going to use another keyword and we are going to see also how to, to create a module. So, so to have a JavaScript file that actually share content, so one JavaScript file can call a method of another JavaScript file. Mm. And right now we, we did all of this with modules with the, the imports that we have in the JS for SQLite, for DJS, etc. But we also are going to see how to do it manually. And uh, an important concept in JavaScript in general, but especially in the browser, uh, that we have briefly, very, very briefly seen in the past lectures are events and events loop. Uh, so the event loop is that thing that I mentioned to you when we spoke about asynchronous code, asynchronous programming. Um, and I told you that JavaScript is single thread, so you cannot have to process two threads going in parallel, but yet we have seen that we can have code that is running asynchronously. Um, so how does it possible? If it's just one big thread, how can we have things doing, working in parallel? Uh, and this is enabled by how JavaScript work, and especially through the uh, event loop. And event loop is called because it's called in this way because uh, one of the main concepts in JavaScript that we see a lot in the browser, way more than in Node.js, uh, is the concept of event. Mm? So JavaScript, most of the time, we are going to work event-based. So something happens, and we in JavaScript, do something else. The person click on the button. That click on the button on the page generate an event, the click event. And we're going to react to that click event, making the behavior corresponding to that specific button in the case. And JavaScript generates, and also the browser, generates a lot of events. Um, there are 100 different type of events, not different events, just different categories of events. And they can have three behavior, or they can be defined and in, in, in three ways. Um, no, they can be defined in two ways, and then they can have three behaviors. We have the predefined events and predefined behavior. So, the click events on a button is predefined. It's not an event that we are going to generate on purpose. It's not a custom event. It's an event that exists. And we, we can either intercept that, 
because we are interested in doing something specifically after that button is clicked, or we can ignore it. We don't care about that specific event. Hmm? So it's difficult that we ignore maybe a click event, but there are other events in the browser that we often ignore or that are handled automatically by the browser. Hmm? And then we have the user defines events and events handler. Mm -hmm. So the user defines event are events that we can define. We can define the new event if we want. We are not going to, but it's possible to define a new event that is triggered in, some, in a specific moment. And we, instead, we are going to define event handler. Mm -hmm. So event handlers are function that will be executed when an event is intercepted. Again, when the click event on a specific button is uh, executed, is thrown, we will have our own event handler that will get that click event and will do something. Hmm? So if it's a click on a delete button, we will probably delete something. If it's a click on a show all button, we will have a different behavior than delete. Hmm? And this function that describe what we want to do uh, once that an event is uh, thrown, is an event handler that is defined by us, hmm? by us as developer. And all these events, how they work. So uh, let me go here and let's try to, to speak on this picture. Uh, so there are a lot of events. Hmm? Um, this is how JavaScript work. We, we can recognize three parts here. This one with the big JavaScript um, uh, name in, with the yellow background is JavaScript. It is JavaScript um, uh, language, is the JavaScript environment that we already used in Node.js. Here is where you write your code, this is a stack, where all the function will be put, all the lines, all the instruction will be put and so run one after the other in a synchronous, in a synchronous way. And then you have the memory heap, memory heap where you have the object allocated in memory, etc. And this is JavaScript, the same JavaScript that we have in the browser and on Node.js. This is the ECMAScript. This is the implementation of the ECMAScript standard. It's actually JavaScript. And then we have other two elements. Uh, we have the, uh, let's say a space hmm, here that are APIs. Hmm. Uh, all of this is the execution environment. Hmm. So we said at the beginning of the course that .js is one execution environment and the browser is another execution environment. Hmm. So this is all this picture is the execution environment. Hmm. All these three part. Uh, the web APIs here, this part here, and also these mm, are part of the execution environment. Mm. So Node.js has this, a, a browser has this. Mm. Uh, what are the difference? The difference are not here, mm, are not here, because this is JavaScript. Mm. So nothing particularly different is this, the language, the standard language, are not here. The difference, because this is how JavaScript work, the differences are here. The browser and Node.js as a set of APIs that are available to JavaScript to do things, to the various things that are related to specific execution environment. So set them out we have encountered this, set them out is an API that is specifically for Node.js and happens to be called in the same way also for browsers. Uh, an API to accessing a file on disk, also open a file, or get input from the keyboard in the console, that are APIs available, are available, are made available by Node.js, by the Node.js APIs. Because the browser cannot access directly to a file, cannot open a file, cannot have input on a console 
a browser on the, on the, the, the terminal. Hmm? The browser will have different set of APIs, hmm? like the documents for manipulating the DOM, hmm? that instead we don't have in Node.js because we don't have the DOM in Node.js. Hmm? So these are the set of APIs that mostly are different among execution environment uh, that made JavaScript specific for that execution environment. Hmm? So those web APIs for browsers are more or less the same. Uh, I'm saying more or less because some browser implements something more and some other browser implements something less of these APIs, but still hmm, at a certain point they will be probably standard and then all the browser will implement them. Uh, and another execution environment, Node.js, will have a different set of APIs. Mm? Again, these APIs are for the specific nature of the environment, of the execution environment. It's a desktop environment, it's a browser, it's anything else. Mm? So where the personalization with respect to the environment where JavaScript is running happens. And then we have this callbook, callbook queue and the event loop. And this part is where the synchronous um, happens. Hmm? Um, so let me see. Oh, I don't, remember. I don't, I don't have the link here. Okay. Uh, so how JavaScript is working hmm? uh, in in a browser or in Node, it's it's the same actually. So we have here hmm, our JavaScript code in this call stack. We have here a console.log. And then here in position number two, we have a set them out. That is a synchronous. So, uh, uh, so when we start the program, we have the call stack with some instruction in it taken in order from our code. Uh, we will have everything else here empty. And here we will have also this these are the web APIs, but it's also space where um, asynchronous calls are temporarily stored, hmm? where are executed. So we have the console.log here, first line console.log. How is JavaScript working? JavaScript is checking. There is something in the stack. Yes, there is console.log. Good, I'm going to execute the console.log and throw it away from the stack. So here, in the first place, we will not have any more the console.log because it was executed, and the second one hmm, will be put, so it's a stack. Hmm, it will be put in the first position, and it will be executed. Uh, the second one, we said, is a timeout. Hmm? We are going to do another console log in two seconds. Hmm? So the stack is, JavaScript is evaluating that, set timeout, two seconds, console log after two seconds. And what is going to do? It's going to bring this function hmm, and put it here. Hmm, and saying, well, after two seconds, execute this. And after doing this operation, this, the call stack is moved another step. So the set them out is removed from the call stack and the third element, in this case, will be put in the first position because it was the second and then it came the first and it's executed that element. After two seconds, what happens? What happens is after two seconds, these set them out here expire because two seconds are passed and set them out but any asynchronous call in this way and it, the instruction, the console.log that was associated to the set out is put in this callback queue. Mm -hmm. So the callback queue is maybe empty, so our console.log will be put here in the first position. Mm -hmm. And what happens now? Mm -hmm. Happens that JavaScript through the events loop, that is this thing here, periodically check whether there is something in the stack and if there is something in the callback queue. 
So if there is something in the stack, the stack is always executed, no matter if there is something in the callback queue. If the stack is empty, then the callback queue is executed. So if we are at the end of our program, we have nothing left in the stack, and so JavaScript will execute this console.log. If we have something else in the stack, even if two seconds are passed, that element will remain in the callback queue until the stack is empty. That's why I told you that all the synchronous code, also the timeout, will happen around two seconds. Because after two seconds, they are actually moved in the callback queue. But then we don't know hmm, how much time will pass before this asynchronous call is removed from the callback queue. Maybe it's immediately because the stack is empty, or maybe it's either one second because the, the stack is still uh, with something in within. Hmm. So this is how JavaScript uh, does things asynchronously. Uh, get things from the stack. If it's an asynchronous call, we'll wait for the time and we'll wait for the operation to complete somewhere, and then we will we'll put here at the end in the callback queue. And through the events loop, we'll check, is the stack empty? No, let's ignore, let's ignore the callback queue. Again, is the, is the stack empty? Yes, so let's put, let's take one thing for the callback queue and execute it. Uh, and continues to operate in this way. So if we here, in the call stack, we have a very long for loop that does a lot of operation synchronously, then we can wait forever for any asynchronous operation to be completed because we are blocked in the stack. We are blocked executing even the last element on the stack. Uh, and so again, that's why it's, I told you, it's more or less two seconds. So at a certain point they will be executed, but we don't have a guarantee of when they will be. Hmm? So this is how the asynchronous part is, is working in JavaScript in a abstract way, clearly. Hmm? But these are the three elements. There is JavaScript, there is the specific APIs, and there is the callback queue that is filled only when the asynchronous code is completed, is done. So after two seconds, or when the database returns something from um, the execution. And then, again, the event loop is evaluating periodically the things. Is it more or less clear? More or less. Um, so here there is uh, the description of what uh, I, I, I told you, um, more or less. And it's, and, and it's also why it's important, hmm, and also why JavaScript use a lot of s as a synchronous code with respect to synchronous code for doing a long operation. Because if these long operations are synchronous, then we'll, they will block the stack and they will block everything else, every other asynchronous operation. Because if you have a long operation here, it will stay here until the long operation is completed. So everything else is not happening. Everything else that is asynchronous is not happening. And that's why JavaScript, again, is more prone to have asynchronous callbacks, asynchronous events and they build this promise and then they build the sync await uh, couple etc mm -hmm. for, for for that reason because it's inherently single traded and use this trick to to simulate a synchronous parallel code execution okay so a, a few words about the bomb and the dom mm -hmm. uh, so there are, as I told you before, there are 
two main objects um, in, in the browser. One is this window and is a child document that is used to access the DOM. So window is the object that is a global object, implicit object, that represent the window that contain the DOM documents, so the, the HTML page on is parsed. Uh, and the window allows to uh, operate with the DOM and also with the BOM, so the browser object model. That has a particular characteristic that differently from the DOM, so from the document, uh, the BOM, the browser object model, is not standardized. So any browser can do things slightly different because they, so if they speak each other and they agree on something, it's fine, otherwise every, every, every browser, every producer of browser can do everything that you want. There is no standard hmm, about the BOM. Hmm. Uh, instead, the DOM is accessed through the document object and give you the tree hmm, of the page loaded and parse it in a window. And again, you can write window.documents or just document to access to this object. And which are the browser object model properties that more or less are shared between various browsers? Uh, we have the console. Mm -hmm. uh, when we write console.log, actually this is, in this case, the browser console. In the Node.js case, is the Node.js console. Hmm? So they are two different. They use the same term, luckily, but they are two different objects, two different things. Hmm? Uh, now, it, this is so uh, built in history that they are not going to change it, but hypothetically, they can decide tomorrow that console on the browser use a different name. Or Node.js can decide that console.logs does not exist, but is print.log or terminal.log or whatever they want. Hmm? This is not going to happen, probably, because it's so used to have console.something, but still console is an object that is related to a execution environment. Hmm? Uh, so this is a browser object because the console is not inside the page. Hmm? The console is in the browser. So it's implemented by the browser. So it's outside your specific HTML page. Hmm? So window.console or just console will give you access to the browser console, the one that appear when you do inspect element. Uh, then there is a document object for the DOM. There is a history hmm, that allow to access to the history of the browser, the previous page, the page visited yesterday, etc. Location uh, that allow access to location API that give you the current URL of, of the page, but also the protocol is HTTP, HTTPS, something else, file, hmm, like we used last week, etc. And location give you the possibility to read and write those, those operations. So you can manipulate the URL through JavaScript. Hmm. So you can say, okay, which is the a URL that I, I, I mean? It's polito.it slash something or change this URL. So go to this page and we'll allow you to manipulate the location in which the browser in. Again, all of these are browser related properties and action. And then there are also, among many others, uh, and this is actually, this is standardized uh, because it's part of HTML5, uh, it's the local storage and the session storage. So the browser, modern browsers, have some kind of storage, very, very light DB inside, uh, that will allow you to store things temporary in a little bit more persistent way than not just a variable. Mm -hmm. And so there are two separate objects, local storage and session storage, uh, that are useful to store small information within a browser. Again, all these operations act on the browser, not on your web page, not on JavaScript. And through JavaScript, you access to properties and methods and action made available by the browser. Mm -hmm. So if you want to store something uh, temporary in a browser, you can use it, the local storage, to store, I don't know, the, 
the ID of the user that is logged in on the page, on a specific page. And that will remain across different sessions, different opening and closing of the browser, because it's like a small DB inside the browser with very, very simple APIs. And we are going to use, uh, I think, the local, the local storage when we are going to speak about authentication in React. But this will be like the last week of the course or something like this. Um, so there are, again, methods. You call it like console.log, like history.something, like location equal something else to change location. And then there are the um, DOM operation. Uh, and well, there are a lot of methods for manipulating the DOM, uh, really a lot of them. And here there is the link of a tutorial that is complete. Here in this hour, we are going to focus just on the core concept, on the main things. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we already spoke a little bit about the DOM, mm -hmm. that is the representation of the HTML page on sparse. Mm -hmm. So we have head, head as, uh, HTML, HTML has two children, head and body, in body, in this case, there is a div, that are, then there are added two divs, and then inside one of these divs, there is a table, and then inside the table, there is the table row, and inside the table row, there is the table head, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how the page is unfolding on the tree that is representing on the page, and these methods allow you to navigate and to cherry pick part of this tree. So if you want to change something here, there are methods to get all the tables in the document. So you can have all the tables in it, etc. All the elements or element of a certain type, of element with a certain CSS class, or element with a certain ID. There are methods in the DOM, in the document object, to access to these elements, to read and change them. Also to add, if you want an element here, if you want, so to manipulate the DOM in reading and writing. And this API, and additionally, this API will allow you also to add event listener to the DOM, to touch event listener to the DOM. So I want to intercept the click event on a button. You can use the document object to do all of this. So all the DOM manipulation elements are in the document object. And, and we have different type of nodes in the DOM, in the document objects. Uh, well, there is the document per se, that is a node. There is the root of the tree, of the entire HTML tree as parsed. Uh, there is then the element that is an HTML tag. So any HTML tag is of type element. Uh, attribute is an attribute of a specific tag. Uh, text is the text content of an element or an attribute, hmm, the text that you put inside an element or inside an attribute. The comment is a different type of object, is an HTML com comment, comment. And the document type is just the doc type declaration the first row that you put in the HTML. And, and you can, so you see there is the body, for instance, is an HTML body element uh, that is of type HTML element, that is of type element, that is of type node, etc. And some methods will give you elements, some methods will give you or will ask you for text, and some methods for manipulating the DOM will give you nodes. So, the, like the root elements for all of these, and then you have to understand if it's an element, an HTML element, a comment, a text, etc., because it's just a node. So a node could be a text, an element, or a comment. So you have to understand which type is it, according to what you want to do. So some methods for manipulating the DOM will give you nodes, others will give you more specific type of elements. Uh, and all of these, for instance, will give you a list of nodes, hmm? specifically a node list that is an array-like sequence of nodes. Hmm? So uh, the length property, hmm? uh, so sorry, this node list can have the same methods than uh, the JavaScript array. 
So you can have the length of the node list. You can have for each. You can do use it for for off because it's like an array. You can have entries, keys, and values for getting the keys, the values, or the entry of the array. So all the methods that you can use with a JavaScript array also work on this node list type because internally is an array. It's like a JavaScript array. Hmm? So when, when you say node list, think about how an array. You can use all the methods and all the, the way for iterating on an array on a node list. Hmm? And here there are a few very, very common uh, methods. You see all of them start from documents. We can also write wind of the documents, but is not needed uh, for finding dot, uh, DOM elements. Uh, the first three, get elements and get element by something. Get element by ID and will just give you one element, the element with that ID that you specify in the, as the argument or get elements by tag name. I want to have all the tables. I want to have all the divs. Get elements, all the elements by, by tag names or by class name. I want to have all the elements with the specific CSS, CSS class and give you another list of all these elements. And these are the three classical way to uh, finding elements in the DOM. Uh, then we have other two methods that are more or less equivalent, but more gener general. That are the query selector and the query selector all. Mm -hmm. The query selector and the query selector all, uh, which is the difference between the two? The difference is that the query selector will give you the node corresponding to uh, the operation that you are calling and the query selector all will give you a node list of the elements. Hmm? So like get element and get elements, here are the same. Query selector one, Qu uh, query selector all, all. Hmm? And what he wants as parameter? is more general, it's more flexible. The parameter of these two is a CSS selector. So everything that you can write as a selector in CSS can be used here to query the DOM, to get elements in the DOM. So you can use an ID as a selector, and so query selector of that ID is the same things or get element by ID of that ID. Uh, but you can also have more complex things, like I want this class but all, or this element, this tag, but only if it's the first child of this other element. So you can build more complex queries in a way to select specific element using the same syntax that you are using for um, CSS selectors. So the same selectors again that you put in the, Java, in the CSS file you can put here uh, as a string here as parameter and you can select those elements. So again, these three are the old class, uh, let's say, methods. They work, they work well. Very, very specific for ID, tag, and class name. The other two are more, a little bit more modern and are more generic, hmm? but there is no, no really a preference on using one or the other. Hmm? You can use query selector for getting an ID or you can use get element by ID for getting the same ID. It's, they are equivalent. Again, the difference is that the last two are more generic. So you can select things that are not an ID, a tag, or a class, if you want. Uh, notice that not finding methods work also on elements, because actually elements are a child of, of nodes. Um, and here there is uh, an example. Uh, so you can say, okay, I found this, I found the main, I get the element that has main as an ID, and then on that element, that is a, an HTML element, I can get hmm, all the elements within 
main within the elements tagged with ID main mm, that are paragraph. Mm, so you can combine them. Mm. So you, you don't have to access just the root. You can access an element, and then inside that element, you can look for other things inside that element if needed. Mm. Or you can use a query selector if you want to have the same results in one line with query selector all. Um, and here there is a, an example, um, and, and what the browser will show. So if you run this, and uh, you see, uh, if you run this uh, in the console of the browser, if you open a, that HTML page and console the browser, write document.getElementById something, you will get in the console of the browser the preview of what you found. Also, if you do console.log from a JavaScript file. So you, you will have the node list. You can also inspect the node list within the browser console. So for instance, uh, let me open this. If we go here in the console, and I don't remember it what is here in this HTML page. Um, let's say that we want to have the table. Mm -hmm. So we can say write document dot um, query selector all table. Mm -hmm. And you see that you get an odd list in this case, well, maybe you don't see a lot, but um, uh, you, you see the, the table, the only table that we have in this case in a node list, because we said query selector all. And in this case, we know that happens to have just one table. And with the table, with all the elements without the table with attributes, the class list, the children, mm, and we say that there is a table height, and you've select something here, it's highlighted on the browser, in, in the window, in the, in the actually table on screen. Mm. So you can also see what you are selecting if you're curious or you, maybe something is not working right, you can open the console and just write document dot, the selection that you're going to, to do and see which are the results and manipulate that also here as a like, like a debugging uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Then there are ways to navigate the tree. So starting from a node, you can get the parent node to the parent nodes method, the previous sibling, the next sibling, mm -hmm. so the elements on the same level in the tree, or the first child, the last child, or all the child with the child nodes. Mm -hmm. They will give you uh, an array. So starting from a node, you can navigate around those nodes. So if you got the table, you want to get the elements just before the table, whatever it is, you can say parent node, the container of the table. If you want to get the elements that is at the same level of the table, you can say the previous or the next sibling. Mm -hmm. So once you have an element, you can also navigate the tree in this way. Um, and attributes are exposed in JavaScript like properties. And so you want to change the ID of something, like the body, you can write document.body.id, equal something new. And that in that moment, that something new will become the new ID of the body. Or also with the um, square parentheses uh, format. So documents, body, uh, in quote, and then ID in quotes, like uh, an array, hmm? an array of array. And this happens for writing, but also for reading those elements, for accessing those elements in any way. Uh, I, I'm going a little bit quick on this, because actually we don't need to remember all of this. Nobody remembers all of this. Uh, but just to tell you that they exist, and they are in the documentation or in the slides. Uh, nothing really complex here. There are methods for entering text attributes. 
as attributes, verify if a specific tag has an attributes, get attributes, get the specific attributes of an element, etc. So everything actually, a lot of things that you can imagine to do with a tag or to find a tag, there is probably a method to do that. So you want to get an attribute, there are um, a way to get an attribute with a method or you can also get an attribute like this. It's like this one here. So there are alternative methods to do the same thing. Uh, you can also create elements. So all of these are for querying elements, but you can also create elements. How with the create element object or with the create text node if you need to create a text. Um, so here there is an example. The first one, start from document and create, a docu create an element that is a div. Hmm? Then for this div, set up the class name and the inner text. Hmm? And the output of this will be div, because the element created, the class, that is the one that you inserted here, and the inner text, that is the text that is inside the div. So you can create elements in this way. It's a lengthy way. Hmm? Because you have to create a div with inside another div, with inside a table, you have to create the table. Then you have to create the outside div and put the table inside the div. And then you have to create manually the external div and put everything else inside the external div. So it's quite lengthy and things need to be done in the right order. Hmm? Uh, because you, you need to create the table before putting it in the container the div that is containing the, the table, otherwise you have nothing to, to add to, the, to that side div. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can specify properties, classes, ID, uh, div.id will allow you to set up the ID, etc. Uh, notice that is class name and not class, mm -hmm. because this is still JavaScript and class is a protected word. Mm -hmm. So it's, there is a, a things called class in JavaScript, so you cannot use class. In this case, in any case, also in React, we will see this. Anytime we need to use a class, like a CSS class, it will become class name. Or class something else. Never class, because class is a separate kind of, of object. And again, once you create an object, you have to insert that object in the DOM. So just creating the object does not have the object inserted in the page or visualized in the page. So you are creating the div. You want the div to appear on the page. You have to insert the div in the DOM. What I told you before, you're creating a table. You have to put it in the div that contains the table. And then if you create also this second div, you have to put it on the div that contains this second div. And then if you created also this third div, you have to put it in the body of the page. So in an element that is already in the DOM, otherwise the page will not be rendered because it will not be part of the tree. You just create an element, but you don't attach it to the rest of the tree, and so the browser will not show, show it. And there are plenty of methods, actually, to um, add elements in the DOM. Uh, append child is one of the, say, standard, more used. They just append the element as a child of the elements that contains. So in this case, append, append a div to the, as a child of the body, just in, in the last position. Uh, but then they say, why not provide other 11 methods to do the same thing? And so you can append child, you can insert before and also replace child. Or you can append, prepend before, after, and replace with. A lot of methods. Uh, so here, you see what happens. So append, hmm, if you have a, an, o, an not ordered, an ordered list. This is an ordered list. One, two, three, four. Hmm. So if you add something after, you add. So if a new element, you add it after. You add it after. Ol, you add it after. If you add it before, you add it before. Ol. If you prepend it you add before the first child of OL. If you append, you add it after the last child of OL, if you are targeting OL, clearly. 
So depending on what you want to do, you can fine tune where to put the elements. Is the first child, is the last child, it's outside of the element after or before the element. Or is actually replacing a specific element. So I'm going to replace this all well with something else. Mm? And so we can replace with or replace child. Mm? Uh, and the difference here is that uh, the first three will start from the parent element and you append things or prepend things to the parent element. Uh, the second set instead start from the node you want to do things. Mm? So that's why a replace child here replace the current node with the old child. Instead here, you just, you don't have the old node because the old node, it is one. It's the one that started, uh, that contains the method. So parent element dot, uh, I don't know, ol dot replace child, a new li with these two, the second li is the first thing. And here, instead you will write the node representing this li replace with the new li element. Depends who is the starting of this. Uh, to insert text inside a content, you can use the inner text property. Div, div dot inner text will allow you to insert the text. And there is also a attribute to insert HTML directly in the page. So inner HTML will or get or set, depends, uh, the element that you pass it as an HTML file. So here div.inner element will give you the HTML, the actual HTML of that div. And if you say div.inner element equal, you then in quotes you can write HTML code. So instead of creating elements, you can also append or insert directly HTML code hmm? instead of creating things manually. Hmm? And similar things happens not just for inserting child, but also for inserting new content. Hmm? So you have insert adjacent HTML text to element and where insert adjacent HTML as before begin, after begin, before end and after end that maps the previous prepend, append, first child and last child essentially hmm? that we have seen before. And you can also clone nodes. If you want to have a clone, a copy of the nodes, there is the clone nodes uh, method. And you can manipulate the class, mm, class list dot add. Mm, uh, so class name, if you want to edit the class of a specific element, uh, you can add remove classes with elements dot class list that will give you access to the entire list of classes associated to an element, even if there is just one thing. And you can add a class, remove a class, toggle a class. That means if it exists, remove it, if it doesn't exist, add it, uh, and check if it contains or not. If this this contain the class call tree, then I will do something. I will change call tree in something else. Else, so for checking uh, classes in a DOM, uh, and then there is uh, element.style that lists the entire style, all the CS properties uh, of, the, of the element that you can also manipulate the style directly uh, with element.style.display equal none. This will set none to the property display of the style of that element. Hmm? Okay, and this is about manipulating the DOM. We are going to see in the exercise some of this thing. Hmm? Not all the methods because all, all in an exercise will be too much, but most of them, uh, a lot of them, let's say, the main, the, the main ones, at least. Um, so, event listener. We have said that JavaScript has events, a lot of events, especially in the browser. You click on a button, you submit a form, you press something on the page, a link, etc. All of these are events. And if you have, a, again, a button for deleting something, 
you click on that button and you want to do something specifically when clicking on the button. And in JavaScript events, these are all events and are determined by two properties. The elements that is generating the events, so who is the button that is generating the click. That is JavaScript is called target. So it's the source of the event. It's the button that you press, but they call it target. And the type of the event is a click event, is a downloaded event, that probably is, is, is less important in most cases, but instead the target is typically important because you want to get a click from a specific target and to behave in a way when that click is from that button and not from any other button in the page. Uh, how do you attach this behavior to, a, um, to an object? Uh, you attach it with the add event listener methods. Mm? The add event listener are two, um, uh, let's say, attribute. One is the events you want to intercept for, to want to listen to. Mm? In the example, mouse down or the load events, the pages load event. Mm? And this add event listener can be attached to the window, to a button, to a div, to any element. Uh, so the first is the type of the events, the events that you want to intercept, click, mouse down, mouse up, etc. The other is the callback in which you get the event and you do what you want. Hmm? So here, for instance, in the second example, uh, that is mouse down, so when you press down the button of the mouse, hmm? so in that moment, that specific event, just pressing down the button, of the mouse, uh, it will console log event.button. In this case, the event object will have the information of which button you have pressed on the, on the, on the mouse. Mm -hmm. So this is something specific to the specific event that is mouse down. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the load doesn't have the information about which button you press because it's loading. Mm -hmm. So in this case, zero is left button and right is right button. It's, sorry, two is right button. So the events contains information, additional information that you may want to use in, in the event listener, in the code that you associate with the behavior of the event. And then you have the target inside this event and also the type of the element hmm, inside that event variable. And yeah, there are a, a lot of events. Hmm. There are keyboards events, form events, uh, CSS events, animation, click, mouse over, uh, focus. This element, this input text has the focus, so it's highlighted and people is right, right, writing it or not. All of these are events that you have. Scrolling, I'm scrolling on a page, it's generate an event. Every time you scroll, you navigate on a page vertically, etc. Um, and many events, have a default behavior that are typically not intercepted. Like when you click on a link, that is the browser that intercept the event for all links and will go, will, go, will go to another page following the link. Or when you submit a form, like a login form, that form sent is another event that is automatically intercept and will behave creating going to another page either visible or not, going to another URL. And if needed, and we are going to do it for forms in React, we often need to prevent this event. Uh, in some cases, you need to prevent this behavior because you want to change it. So if you want to change the event for a specific link, instead of going to a URL, doing something different, you can, pr you can add an event listener to that click event on the link, Prevent the fault as first thing, and then write your own code. So this, you say the to the browser, don't do the usual thing for these events. Just do the things that I want to do. Without preventing the fault, the browser will have priority on your own specific user-defined event behavior. Uh, then there are three uh, lifecycle events for HTML, DOM content loaded, 
when the browser, browser loaded all the HTML and the DOM tree is ready, external resources may have not been loaded yet. Images, uh, videos, CSS file, maybe they are not loaded, but the DOM is ready. There is the container for the image. Maybe there is not the image on screen, but the container is there. Uh, load is the event that is the final window uh, when the browser finishes loading everything. All the HTML, all the CSS, all the images, all the multimedia content, all the JavaScript, everything. Uh, before unload and unload is when the user is trying to guess when the user is about to leave the page or left the page, when you close the tab of the window of the browser. Slightly before, it should be generated this event. Clearly, given that the browser cannot really know the future, this is not totally reliable. Uh, in some cases, it works because it intercepts the close operation bef just and send the, the events, but then the page is, is, is removed, you don't have the DOM anymore. So it's not really reliable. Most of the time you don't have time to do anything after this event because actually maybe the browser is just closed. But exist before unload and unload. Um, Quickly, a couple of information about forms. Uh, we are going to introduce forms now, like five, 10 minutes, then we, we have a break. Uh, we are going to introduce form now, but we are not going to use forms for a while. Uh, because forms work in a slightly different way in React, so we are going to reintroduce better forms in React. But form is a HTML element specific that has its own specific behavior that are independent from the fact that you use React or not. And form as a tag that is called form and as uh, one, let's say, mandatory attribute, two mandatory attributes. One could be default. Uh, the mandatory attribute is action. Action is the URL that is the destination of the submission of the form. So you have a form for creating a, user, a new user on your website, register to a website, you press register the user, those information go to that URL written in action. That is the default behavior. A form will submit to a specific URL. And it's mandatory. And this is the behavior we often, we will prevent in React. Because we don't want to have a new page. We want to handle the form within the same page. But this is the default, the default behavior. And this is a mandatory attribute, uh, action. And then there is the method for submitting the, the, the HTTP method for submitting the form. Hmm? That if, when it's not written, is get. It's by default get. Uh, typically, in a form, is post or put. Hmm? Because you don't pass information in the URL. Imagine you're logging in, you don't pass username and password in the URL of the browser. You pass it in an object that is not visible from the browser. So with a post or put method. And then inside the form, you, have, you can have normal content, you can have divs, you can have paragraph, etc., and also form control. Uh, and we have seen a few of them already in our table, like the input. The input text is for inserting text, input, information, could be text, could be numbers, could be anything else. Uh, and can have a placeholder, that is the things that appear on the element. Um, you can also locate a form in the DOM in this way. To locate a form in the DOM, you have these attributes that is documents.forms. Documents.forms will give you all the form in a page. So typically in a page, often in a, in a page you have just one form, but yet you have this collection, this node list of form. And then you can access the form by ED. And then you have the specific form and you can manipulate or get information from the form. 
And then the form has the elements attribute, the properties that collect the information about the inner elements of the form, like the inputs that you have inside the form. Also them need to be accessed by ID. Um, input can have different type, it could be type text, it could be type checkbox, it could be type date, it could be type email, it could be type password, and it renders a little bit differently. We, we have seen here, hmm, all of these in the last line are, except the bottom, are input. But the first one is input date, and the other ones are input text. Hmm. If you use input password, you will see when you type, instead of seeing the letters, you will see the black dot that you are used to see when you're inputting a password. And this is a default type for HTML. Hmm? You can have email, uh, file, you can have a form that is hidden, etc. Hmm? And so there are a lot of inputs control. It could be a range, it could be a search, it could be a submit, it could be a URL, it could be a radio button, etc. And this input control has a series of attributes, uh, so like checked. Checked is the attribute to check when a radio box or a checkbox is selected. Hmm? You know that it's selected through the checked uh, attribute. But you can also say that the control is disabled, or that the control is read-only. So you can just read, you can type on it. Or that it's required. This is especially important in form. This information is required. You cannot complete the form without inserting this information. The size, the autocomplete, if can you use this autocomplete feature on the browser or not, etc. And uh, Visual Studio Code will, when you type on input, will uh, also give you these options in autocomplete uh, as the code. Mm -hmm. uh, then inside, Together with an input, you should always use uh, the label elements that is a caption to that element. Hmm? So typically, if you have a checkbox, the label is the text that is accompanying the checkbox. Hmm? And this should be always present hmm? when possible, for accessibility purpose uh, especially, so that the screen reader can understand what is this checkbox about and which is the one. Is the first one, is the second one. If you don't see this thing, you just see, do you like cheese? Where I have to operate? In this or in this? In which one of these two? Actually, you, you don't know if you don't use label. If you use label, this is attached to this and this is attached to this. So when you click on the text, you say, yes, I like cheese, then the corresponding checkbox is, um, marked. This is with accessibility feature, not in, in general. In general, it's just the, the text that is assigned to a specific input. Uh, then you have a text area that is a multi-line text field um, that behave different across, uh, that appears slightly different across browsers, um, like the focus. In one case is blue, in the other case is by default purple, etc. Or the disable. In some cases, it's really disabled. In the other, you see the text, but you cannot change it. This is dependent on the browser. Uh, then you have the drop down control that is written this way. It's a select with options inside, hmm? just HTML, essentially, writing HTML. Uh, there is the button control we already used last week. Uh, the button that can have a type or not. Uh, with submit or reset is typically the button of a form. To submit the form or to reset the content of the form. In other, in other occasions, it's just a button, like the one that we have in our example that we did last week. Um, actually, you can have an input with type button or a button with type button. Uh, actually, so button as implicitly type button, but you can also have an input with type button. They actually are the same, but button is more flexible, in which you can, for instance, add an image inside the button, while an input with type button is just text. So for button, it's preferred to use the button tag that exists now. In the beginning, 
you just have the input with type button, but now with modern, let's say, HTML, you also have the button tag. That is more flexible hmm, than the input. Input is very, very limited. Um, again, and also default appearance, this applies to all inputs. Write a button, checkbox, text elements, etc. in input of are rendered by the browser, implemented by the browser, so the default appearance might vary. We have already seen that in the date last time, in the calendar last time, that on Chrome appears in a way on, with a specific width, on Firefox appears in a different way with a different width, and the width is, is, is fixed, so if you resize the page, it's not responsive. Because all of this, because all the inputs are implemented in a browser-dependent way. And so how to have nicer form, typically use external libraries to have forms to replace the default input style. Because also uh, changing the style of the inputs element is terribly difficult. It's not just, oh, let's add the class. It's more complex than that. Um, and external libraries already do the, the complex thing. And in some things, it's not even possible. So external library either replace that uh, default element with something else, and then under the hood, they call it the same input uh, attributes or the same, the same input action, uh, or you do all the, the various uh, particular things that are needed to personalize inputs. So for instance, checkbox. Checkbox by default are with a blue background when you click it, if you want, and, and squared. If you want to change it, you can use it to the checkbox provided by library, or you can uh, write five lines of CSS code to try to change just the border and the color in a very specific way, not just adding a class or saying the border radius is three pixels. It doesn't work. You need to target specific elements within the checkbox. Specific elements that are hidden, that are, you have to know which. So you have to search specifically for those elements in the, in the checkbox. So it's, it's especially difficult to, to do that in uh, um, in in css in plain simple css uh, finally inputs uh, um, so all the inputs element as events mm, you have the change events when something changes the text when you type something you can have the cut copy and paste events you can know if it's something that's copied or, or not or pasted or not that's why how some if you if you navigate, sometimes you try to paste something in, a, in an input and the browser tells you, you cannot paste here. That's why they intercept, and this is a very bad thing, but they intercept the action corresponding to paste and will prevent the default action that is uh, pasting things in an input. Hmm? Uh, invalid, blur, focus, etc. There are events, and here there is an example, uh, events for, um, uh, for, for all the inputs. And as I told you, uh, the form submission uh, as a submit event that we are going so often to prevent the fault with just event or to prevent the fault so that we can here handle what we want to do with the form instead of opening a new page. Mm -hmm. This is something that we, we are going to do in, uh, in React. Okay. Any question? So we can have 15 minutes, also 20 of break. <laughs>